thymosine alpha-1. I'm curious how many of you guys have heard of this. So thymosine alpha-1 is a peptide. What are peptides? Peptides are where you have two or more amino acids that are linked in a chain. Usually it's a lot more than two, uh, very long chains of amino acids. Now, I don't personally have firsthand experience with uh, thymosine alpha-1, I just know about it in theory. Um, I do have some firsthand experience with other peptides in the sense that I have injected on a Blanca of my girlfriend with them. Um, so I've injected her with two other ones. I've, we've used uh, BPC-157 and thymosine beta-4, which is also known as TB-500. These are not for the same purpose as one would use thymosine alpha-1. Um, these other two are more focused around um, accelerated healing and healing of, of some old injuries. Um, so those are something else. But whenever we're talking about injectables, I always feel compelled to preface it with this is not something where I'm trying to give you medical advice. I'm not a doctor. I'm not your doctor. Um, any kind of decisions to use something like this should be made in conjunction with and the guidance of your functional medicine practitioner. Uh, and this is something where I am just sharing with you as friends uh, information that I have been exposed to and, and gathered over time. And this is just uh, a, a, a a geeking out conversation of us looking at the cool things that exist in the world today, right? So thymosine alpha-1, this for the rest of the conversation today, I'm going to call it TA1 just for brevity, right? If I have to say thymosine alpha-1 500 more times, it's going to make this video uh, much longer than it needs to be. So let's go for TA1. So the benefits of this peptide are generally centered around immune health. And this is a peptide that actually is produced in small amounts in the body naturally in the thymus gland. That's in part where the name comes from. So let's go back to the beginning. What was the first study done on TA1? We're gonna to go to 1975. And this was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine where they were gonna see, does TA1 increase the number of what are called T cell rosettes, T cells being one of the main active cells in your immune system. And so they looked at, at two different groups, one group with what's called primary immunodeficiency, and the other group had an active viral illness. And this was mostly done in petri dishes after they extracted lymphocytes from these people, and they combined the lymphocytes with TA1. And so they found really positive effects from this. Uh, and so it was increasing these T cell rosettes. And then they took one person, just one person. And so this is like, you know, it's hard to gather any real knowledge from a study if it's just done on a single person. But uh, this was a person with primary immunodeficiency and thymal hyperplasia. And they were given TA1 in vivo, they actually injected it into them. And it increased T cell rosettes by 33%. And they showed a lot of improvement in terms of their symptoms. But they later on became hypersensitive to TA1 and they were not able to keep taking it. So it was kind of like, it's hard to say what to gather from that. So uh, not a lot interesting happened in the TA1 world for a while after that study. So we're gonna have to fast forward 15 years now to go to 1990 and we look at a study in the International Journal of Immunopharmacology. And this was looking at the effect on interleukin-2 receptors. Um, and they found that TA1 increased the population uh, of high affinity interleukin-2 receptors that are being expressed by the lymphocytes. And so this was really interesting because now it's starting to show some potential for modulation of immune function. Okay, now we're gonna skip forward another couple of years. We're gonna go to 1995. Now we're going over to Britain. We're gonna look in the British Medical Journal. And here we take quite a few more patients this time. We're gonna look at 15 patients, and these are patients with hepatitis C, and they're gonna be treated with TA1 for 12 months. And so then they checked in, but they didn't wait till 12 months to check in, they had checked in after six months, and they found that seven of them now tested negative for hep C RNA after just six months. And by 12 months, 11 out of the 15 people had tested negative. Um, six months after that, so 18 months from the beginning, but six months after they stopped the treatment, um, six out of those 11 were still negative. So some of them had relapsed. Um, so it, it's hard to draw complete conclusions there, um, but 
it's definitely a very positive indication if even if it was just six out of the 15 that no longer had hep C um, and who knows what would have happened for the other group had they continued doing it for longer than 12 months. Um, now let's jump forward another eight years into the new millennium, 2003. Uh, now we're going to look at 23 patients, and these people had been uh, undergoing other forms of treatment for hepatitis C, but they had not shown any positive response to them. They, uh, these treatments had not been helpful for them, so it was kind of like a dead end. Where are we going to go? Okay, so we're going to try something wild. We'll try this TA1. So. They did TA1, but they didn't do it on its own. They did it in conjunction with several other things. They did it with something called pegylated interferon alpha and ribavirin. And 61% efficacy was found. And it was shown to have an excellent safety profile. Nobody had any side effects. And there were no um, uh, examples of toxicity in these people. So quite promising. Now, uh, a lot of peptides that you encounter are not... Uh, approved by the FDA for anything in particular. But that's not the case here with, with TA1. Uh, this is actually an FDA approved prescription drug known as Zedaxin. Uh, and this is manufactured by a company called Cyclone Pharmaceuticals. Uh, now this has the status of an orphan drug, which means uh, it was a drug developed with government support because it's one of those things where they felt no company would invest to develop it because it, it, the, the population that would need it would not necessarily be large enough uh, but it now does exist and it, you you can get it from other places not just from that one company and i you know want to mention here as well um i've been thinking about the right way to put this and if i put it the wrong way i, I hope you don't uh mind i'm trying my best here but there are a lot of um functional medicine doctors and other medical establishments now that are offering packages with various peptide therapies, and including TA1, uh, at quite, um, sometimes astonishingly high prices. Uh, and then there are ways to get these same stuff, basically, a lot less expensive. Um, now, when you're getting it from a doctor, they'll usually have it already reconstituted. So they'll give you a bottle with uh, what looks like water in there, but it has the peptide already dissolved in it. And they'll give you some needles and you'll draw some out and you'll inject it. Now, first thing that I really want to express is that these peptides are very sensitive. They are very fragile. So you want to handle that glass bottle so carefully. You don't want it bouncing around. You don't want to store it in the door of your refrigerator. You want it on the shelf of your refrigerator so it's not being shaken around. And when you're drawing it out, you want to do it slowly. When you're injecting it, you want to do it slowly because these things are so fragile and you spend a lot of money on them. You don't want to just, you know, have them go to waste and, and you wouldn't even realize. Uh, then, or if you're getting it from these other sources that are less expensive, usually you have to reconstitute it yourself and you want to do that also adding in the water very gently, not, they'll give you a special uh, bacteriostatic water to combine with what looks like a little white powdered rock. Um, and they'll give you instructions on how to do it. Uh, but that you also, you know, want to do it with, with great caution. Um, and you know, in the ideal world, you can get it from a source like that, save a lot of money, and your doctor will still give you the guidance on how to use it and do it carefully uh, and in, in a safe manner, and you don't have to spend an exorbitant amount of money. Um, but again, don't do any of this without medical guidance. Um, I just want to make sure you're aware of different things that are out there. Uh, now, um, this to, to jump back to the, the, the pharmaceutical version of this, the Zedaxin from Cyclone Pharmaceuticals, this is uh, approved in the U.S. for treatment of things like malignant melanoma, uh, hepatitis B, and, and liver cancer, hep, um, hepatocellular carcinoma. And so that's what it's doing here. It's approved for a lot more uh, out of the U.S., or not necessarily approved, but it's being used for a lot of other applications. So it has approval in over 35 countries, and it's used for treating viral infections. It's used for treating immunodeficiencies for for malignancies and um, and HIV and AIDS, for example. So I'm not saying it's going to have any effect on any of these things. I'm, again, I'm just sharing with you information 
on things that are happening out there in the world um, for purely uh, academic interests. So um, definitely something to uh, explore further, talk with your doctor about, see if it might be um, an interesting fit for you. And I hope whether you use something like this or not, that you will be feeling amazing and have a wonderful day.